China and the United States are the world's energy gluttons, and we're only getting hungrier. But China is feeding a much bigger family, 1.3 billion people. They're still growing, and their energy output and energy uh, emissions are going to continue to grow. Energy Now takes you to China for a look at how its people are handling the newfound challenges of wealth and waste. Driving, traveling by train, even walking, they all produce precious kinetic energy. At some point, you know, it'll be illegal to waste energy as heat. Waste no more. A look at some innovative ways to capture and use that lost energy. And opening the emergency spigots? With fears of gasoline prices potentially topping $4, the White House is being urged to dip into the country's oil reserves. Is it time? This is Energy Now. Hello, I'm Thalia Oshuras. Welcome to Energy Now, a weekly look at America's energy challenges and what we're doing about them. Feeding our insatiable energy appetite is one of the biggest challenges, and simply producing enough power to meet the demands of the economy is daunting. The U.S. consumes about one-fifth of the world's total energy. But China has overtaken us and is now the world's biggest energy user. Its taste for power is very different than ours, though. So are the consequences. Energy Now Chief Correspondent Tyler Suters traveled to China, and he joins us to explain why that is. Tyler? Well, Thalia, not only are these the world's biggest energy users, China and the U.S. are also the world's biggest carbon emitters. You put these two together, and they account for more than 40 percent of the world's total. But the reasons we use all that energy and release all those emissions, they're as different as our ways of life. I shadowed one commuter in Beijing to get a taste of why that is, as part of Energy Now's continuing look at the China factor. Her workday probably starts a lot like yours, even if you don't carry a purse. At 8 o'clock, Wang Yuefei is out the door. She's a sales rep in Beijing, working for Johnson & Johnson. She likes her apartment, she enjoys her job, and this might sound familiar, she hates her daily commute even though Wang has it better than many of her fellow Beijingers. And today, she invited me along for the ride. Many people have two hours, more than two hours, three hours. Again, look. Each way. Yes. From what I saw in China, Wang is a typical city dweller. Small apartment, lots of walking, lots of public transportation, not much driving. I mean, yeah, there are four million cars crammed into Beijing's roads. But remember, this city is home to 22 million people. So to put it another way, Wang, a typical Chinese, would be an atypical American. Uh, OK, that needs a little explanation and some perspective as well. China and the U.S., we're neck and neck in terms of the carbon emissions we crank out. But China's annual carbon emissions cover a population of 1.3 billion people. The U.S. needs only a little more than 300 million to churn out about the same amount of pollution. When we're talking about the average energy consumption per capita in China, it's still relatively low compared with other developed countries. She means the United States, of course. Yeah, we love our big cars and our AC and our widescreen TVs. And that affection means to power all our stuff. We burn lots of fossil fuels, especially coal for electricity and, of course, oil. But here's the catch. As the Chinese get wealthier, more of them are starting to live like Americans. China's burning through more coal and oil every single year. And that has EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson concerned. I spoke with her in Beijing. Because of the rate of their development, they're still growing. And their energy output and energy uh, emissions are going to continue to grow, mm -hmm. even though, compared to the United States, they use a lot less energy per person. But using less energy? Well, I found out that takes a lot of energy. It's 8.15, and I want you to keep an eye on that subway worker in the yellow jacket. You see her there lending a helping hand? An everyday reality with so many Chinese competing for so few subway seats. Eventually, we cram our way on board as well. One said, this is not the worst time. It actually gets more crowded than this. That's because the Chinese are rushing from rural areas to urban centers, moving to big cities to find work. They're part of the biggest mass migration in human history. 
as many as 20 million people moving every single year. This is a huge challenge for them in so many ways mm -hmm. that, you know, is, are they thinking about emissions when they're thinking about that? I, I don't think so. But maybe they should because uh, a Chinese moves from the interior of the country to one of these mega cities and his or her carbon emissions skyrocket. Absolutely. When Chinese come to the city, they become a bit more like us Americans. They get access to air conditioning, cars, and satellite TV. Part of the reason China's emission levels are rising. The other reason? In the U.S., most of our carbon emissions come from us, people, our lifestyles. The rest come from industry, making stuff. In China, it's pretty much the opposite. Most of the carbon emissions come from industry, and a much smaller portion comes from the way Chinese live their lives. And that point isn't lost on the central government. Last fall, China shut down more than 2,000 factories. Facilities, it says, were wasting energy. The Chinese government is quick to tout its voluntary carbon intensity reduction targets, essentially pledging to limit the growth of its carbon emissions to the growth of its economy. The problem there is the China economy is roaring forward and the electricity to power all of these gargantuan towers behind me here in Shanghai and all of the new buildings that are now under construction, more than 70% of that electricity comes from burning coal. Look, I mean, their emissions will um, go up less if their carbon intensity targets are uh, ambitious and uh, they fulfill them, but will it stop the overall emissions trend? Uh, no. Back to Beijing, 8.35, and we're walking to our next subway train. How much longer would it take you if you were driving to work? Driving? Uh, at half an hour. More? Half, uh, more than half, one yeah. and a half hour. Saving time, saving a hassle, saving money. That's why an American might, oh, say, buy a smaller TV. That's why Chinese like Wang will endure such an outrageous commute day after day. That's how countries find common ground and agree to cut their emissions. Between our two economies, we're at different ends of the scale, but we're both working on some pretty similar issues. <laughs> Chinese or American, that's how we make our own energy choices every single day. 8.50 a.m., almost an hour after we left Wang's apartment, and we're on our final hot and crowded ride. This one, an elevator. And then we're at work. For Wong, how she gets here isn't about saving gasoline. The important thing is saving my time. But according to the International Energy Agency, time is running out. Chinese or American, we need to find new ways to get our energy or find ways to cope with a much warmer planet. Now, for all the promises about untying its carbon emissions from its economic growth, China apparently isn't doing a very good job of it. A nonprofit research group, CO2 Scorecard, says in 2009, China's carbon emissions rose by the second highest annual total in history. And Thalia, to put that in perspective, the largest annual jump in CO2 emissions of any country in the world, in fact, the six largest annual jumps, they all happened in the last decade, and they all happened in China. I have to ask you one other thing, though. How exhausted were you after that commute? And some people, <laughs> what, two, four hours each way? Uh, the Beijing subway system, Thali, was not built for six foot four, 200 pound Americans. But the hardest part, actually, that. in addition to the crowds, it was the heat. There's virtually no air conditioning when you go through those. So in the summertime, it gets even worse. Tyler, thanks very much. <laughs> Glad you made it. So am I. Thanks, Thalia. <laughs> Both China and the U.S. are focusing on the emissions problem, but American innovators are also working to harness energy that's simply being wasted. When we come back, how to keep the energy of motion from slipping through our fingers. And are surging gasoline prices putting the economy back on the precipice? When is the right time to tap the nation's strategic oil reserves? Mix it up. Dad, nice dad, nice dad. Charles! Nice dad. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of siblings in foster care who take you just as you are. 
Whether it's Middle East instability fueled by Libya's civil strife or speculators projecting coming crises, gas prices are surging. In fact, the Energy Department this week predicted an average $3.70 at the pump this summer. Some scoff at that low number. No one really knows, but the pressing question is, is it time to hit the emergency button? This week, the President's Chief of Staff, William Daly, said that all options are on the table, including siphoning from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves, our emergency stockpile of more than 700 million barrels of oil. Hurricane Katrina in 2005 was the last time that happened. Dipping into the stockpiles, is it a knee-jerk political reaction or keeping the economy from dipping back into the tank? Joining us to talk about it on The Mix are two Energy Now contributors, Tyson Slocum, Policy Director from the Consumer Advocacy Group Public Citizen, and Daniel Weiss, a senior fellow with the left-leaning think tank Center for American Progress. So let's, gentlemen, thanks for being here, and let's jump right into this. Is this an emergency situation? The president can dip into the reserves. Is it time to do it, Dan? It is getting there. We believe that the president ought to take a small portion of oil from our full reserves when either oil hits $125 a barrel or gasoline hits $4 a gallon. Those prices are going to inflict real pain on middle and low income American families. And in past uh, selling of our reserve oil, it has effectively reduced the price. You know, our economy, our economic recovery is still in its shoots. And this uh, high oil prices could smother that growth before it has a chance to flower. Tyson, take that on. I'm going to respectfully disagree. I think the, the fact is, is that we're not in a supply-demand crunch. Um, we've got record levels of commercial inventories. We've got more than a billion barrels of crude oil and refined products in storage. Combine that with the 726 million barrels of oil in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and we've got 1.8 uh, billion uh, barrels of product in the United States. We, there are not physical shortages uh, around the globe. The Saudis are able to come in and step in um, uh, for the shortage of, of Libyan exports. But the president ought to be talking about the real solutions uh, in the short term that are gonna, gonna get us there, which is addressing the role that speculation has in uh, hyping up this market. Because there's no question that we're, but we're, so we're you're saying you want to jump in. Too. Tyson, if you want to go after speculators, this is the best way to burst the speculative bubble, is for the government to say, fine, we're going to put some oil in the market, which will create uncertainty and undo the expectation that the oil price is going to continue to rise as instability in the Middle East increases, which could, unfortunately or, or not, affect Iran, Saudi Arabia, and other much larger producers than Libya or Egypt. And so it's one way, you know, if you read, uh, uh, analysts have been saying this price hike is dear to fear, psychology. One way to address that is taking a big chunk of oil, putting it in the market once we read that, reach that certain threshold. But, but Tyson, is it, is it the government's job to act here to jump into the market? And, and not, not in this case, because throwing this excess crude into an already oversupplied market, I don't think is going to bring prices but down. But if, if the crisis increases to $4, uh, for example. It, or only, only if there's an actual supply shortage. If we see unrest move into Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, that would really threaten global supplies, then yes. But the fact is, right now, Americans are overpaying the risk premium because some Wall Street investment banks are using the crisis in Africa and the Middle East to drive up prices far beyond what the experts believe is what the really what the real right, risk is. Right, which is why we should put some burst that speculative bubble by putting uh, oil in the market. Speculators, who are they? Well, the uh, the CFTC data clearly shows that uh, the net long positions in crude oil markets by non-commercial traders, which are the big investment banks on Wall Street and the index funds that they operate that bring in pension money. They're the ones that are driving this price up. There's no question that speculators have to play a role in the market. I don't want to see speculators driving the market the way they're doing now because they are forcing us to way overpay this risk premium, and it's really going to start to, to hurt the well, economy. Let me, ask, let, me ask, let me ask this question. Does, don't these high prices help the big oil and its allies say, let's start drilling in Alaska? At the same time, don't they help the administration, for example, 
s to say to folks, uh, stay in your car, don't stay in your cars, use public transportation because of high prices. Uh, the energy secretary has already said the market will take care of the prices we need to move to biofuels. In 2008, when oil prices skyrocketed, uh, oil consumption dropped only about 3%. And the reason for that is because it's not a very price sensitive product. What means that happens is, is that middle and low income families take more out of their wallet and give it to big oil and have less for other things. I do have one question to ask you uh, to end this, and what got your blood boiling this week? Dan, well, what got, other than this. <laughs> what got my blood boiling this week is that the House Republican budget that passed would actually make us more dependent on foreign oil by cutting money for research into advanced batteries for cars, by cutting money for transit, by cutting money for assistance to domestic auto manufacturers to build cleaner cars. At a time when oil prices are rising and it's hurting middle and low income Americans, they're cutting money that would help us reduce our oil use and reduce the impact of these volatile prices. Tyson? What got my blood boiling is the embarrassing flip-flop by, by Fred Upton, the chairman of the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, he, in the past, has clearly articulated that the science behind climate change is real, that it's man-made, and that we have to aggressively go after it. And now that uh, his party is swept into power, he is bowing to a very radical fringe within the party and it's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment to the country, and it's an embarrassment to him. He's a lot smarter than this. I think your blood is boiling. Gentlemen, <laughs> both of you, thanks very much. We'll be talking again. You'll keep talking, I know. Thank you, Thalia. Thanks. <laughs> and with today's gas prices, think about this. Only about 15% of that liquid gold you pour into your gas tank actually spins your wheels. Vehicles are so inefficient, the rest is lost as heat or friction, for example. Other modes of transportation are just as wasteful. But that is starting to change. Energy Now's Josh Zepps discovered new technologies that capture the wasted power instead in this Energy Next. Have you ever been on a train and accidentally spilled your coffee on a total stranger? I know I have. See, it happens because the train moves around in all kinds of ways that have nothing to do with actually getting you where you want to go. But imagine if we could harness all this kinetic energy and use it to light the train's lights and maybe even to brew more coffee to throw on yet more strangers. Do you like that idea, huh? Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. We generate a lot of it in this hectic modern world, and almost all of it goes to waste. But a new class of crafty kinetic capturers is changing that. Philadelphia's metro system is run by SEPTA, the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. Chief Power Officer Andrew Gillespie wanted to save a buck on the $12 million in electricity his trains guzzle every year, so he modified the train's brakes to generate electricity as they slow down. We probably use 30% of the regenerate power. The existing trains can use it to power the lights, uh, heaters and such. Doors are closing. What we want to do now is take that energy, uh, which is electricity, send it back through the power distribution system which supplied the power to the train in the first place, and store it. That's the key, storing it. See, normally when you capture a train's kinetic energy, you can either use it to power onboard systems or feed it back into the supply system to be sucked up by another train that needs it in that same split second. But if it isn't used instantly, it's gone. So in this cavernous room at the Letterly Power substation, SEPTA is installing an enormous 1,000 kilowatt battery to store the energy harvested from its braking trains. Whenever it's needed, that stored energy can be sent to other trains, reducing energy waste, reducing costs, and reducing emissions. Is this kind of technology going to be widespread through transit systems in the United States? Oh, I'm sure it will be. I mean, we're not the only ones who are looking at this. Um, it's a technology that's um, just in its infancy, but there's so much power that's not being captured right now. Now, stopping and starting are not the only ways we waste kinetic energy. Anytime you move fast over an unsmooth surface, you bounce up and down. Vehicles are bumpy. It's why shock absorbers were invented. And now they're being reinvented by a pair of kinetically inspired MIT grads at Levant Power in Massachusetts. Essentially what we uh, do is we generate electricity from bumps in the road. We use electricity for fuel economy gains. So the system works by actually shuttling fluid through a hydraulic motor which spins a generator. So as it moves up and down, as your wheel moves up and down, it spins an electric generator and that generates electricity.
Electricity that can power the vehicles, headlights, stereo, GPS, butt warmer in the seat if you're lucky, all things that would ordinarily drain power from the engine. They call this shock absorber GenShock, and its output ranges from tens of watts to several kilowatts. That translates to gas savings of 1 to 5 percent, depending on the type of vehicle and terrain. So this is mimicking the motion of a road as you drive faster and go over all kinds of potholes. This is generating power, which is going to a bank of lights behind me that you can see flashing. When the car's going really fast, you can almost have a rave. Of course, the heavier the vehicles, the bigger the energy return. So Levant is getting a lot of interest from heavy fleet operations. So we're working with the U.S. Army, and they actually they shipped us out a uh, military Humvee, an 1152, that we're actually doing a uh, installation on. So we have the Humvee out back. You have a Humvee? Yeah. Here? Yep. We wow. It's amazing to think that this could be the prototype vehicle from which all of the Army's Humvees could be fitted. So they need to use less power, less energy be more efficient and also a nicer ride, which would be nice. This is not the, this is no Lexus. And in the context of capturing energy, that's a good thing. The beauty of kinetic energy is that because it's everywhere, you can capture it in myriad ways. If you're dealing with urban rail, which stops and starts all the time, harness the brakes. If you're dealing with a workhorse that bounces along rough terrain, harness the shock absorbers. The modern world's incessant bouncing, braking and bumping is an almost unlimited energy source going to waste right under our nose. Thankfully, not for much longer. I think when we look back on it, we're going to realize um, how uh, inefficient we were. At some point, you know, it'll be illegal to waste energy as heat. But don't go using gen shocks as a reason to get a Hummer. I'm just saying. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, Josh Zepps, Energy Now. Levant Power says it will have a product on the market in 2012, but won't reveal who else is working with them. But they did tell us about one of their key advances. They have figured out how to use some of GenShock's power to improve a car's ride and the handling performance. So aside from saving gas, you'll be relieved to know you will also save that coffee from spilling all over the dashboard. Let's hope. So still ahead, goodbye to an oldie but a goodie. Energy legislation is punching the light out of the Easy Bake Oven. Plus, driving with the CDs of the future, not music for the soul, but fuel for the ride. That's next. I think someone at my friend's school has this thing called autism. My friend's brother's son has autism. My neighbor's son has autism. My son has autism. Autism is getting closer to home. Today, one in 110 children is diagnosed with autism. That's a 600% increase in the last 20 years. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. The Department of Energy is always on the lookout for new, clean technologies and gives millions of dollars in stimulus funds to companies with high risk but potentially high reward innovations. Those who have scored some green and others still hoping to recently showcased their innovations in the DOE's second annual Energy Summit. Energy Now's Lee Patrick Sullivan checked it out. Here at the ARPA-E Summit outside Washington, D.C., innovative clean energy technologies are showcased, and it's where items like these can be the next big thing in clean energy. Oh. ARPA-E is one of those Washington, D.C. acronyms. It stands for Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy. It's modeled after the Defense Department's DARPA. The idea is for the government to help spur innovation on projects that would normally not get funding. Out-of-the-box thinking that could brew up and change the world. Think of it as the ultimate science fair, but instead of winning a blue ribbon, you could actually win millions of dollars in Department of Energy funding. Nearly $400 million has already been given out to fund more than 120 projects, like storing hydrogen on a compact disc. Instead of a gas tank, that's a high pressure tank of hydrogen or of gasoline, what we've got is a no pressure set of CD discs 
in the back of your car. The idea here is, instead of plugging in your electric car, these discs can release hydrogen using a laser, the same technology that's in your home CD player. The hydrogen creates electricity and that charges your battery. Thinking of ways to use less energy are also big hits at ARPA-E. Take this thin film being developed by ITN Energy Systems. When these devices are finished and placed onto windows, if you apply a voltage to them, they can change from being transparent to being opaque. The idea here is to let in the sun during the winter to heat the building, block it out in the summer to help cool it. I know, I know, drapes do the same thing, but imagine these things in a skyscraper and every window tinting at the same time with a flick of a switch. And a lot of these technologies have been around for a while, like the thermal photovoltaic cell. So much like uh, a photovoltaic cell or a solar panel will take sunlight and convert it to electricity, we can do that with any source of heat. Just three chips this size could power a small home. Of course, most homes don't produce enough heat to make it practical, but factories do. And all that wasted heat is free and easily captured. The chip sends the heat to a photovoltaic chip where it is converted into electricity. For all you armchair engineers out there saying that photovoltaics can't handle that type of heat from a factory, that's where the secret sauce is. So we have a way that not only keeps the cold side cold, but we're able to let the hot side get very, very hot. In total, 37 out of the 128 ideas showcased in there have been given Department of Energy cash, including the folks that make that window film. At the ARPA-E Summit outside Washington, D.C., Lee Patrick Sullivan, Energy Now. Of the 37 winning projects Lee Patrick just mentioned, six have raised $100 million in private capital. That's four private dollars for every one from the government. It's the government program itself that's in jeopardy. In his 2012 budget, President Obama proposed a budget increase to $550 million for ARPA-E. House Republicans want that slashed to less than one-tenth, down to $50 million. Well, it looks like the Easy Bake Oven we all know and love is cooked. That's what's in this week's Energy Now Hot Zone. That oven, which baked mini cakes using a 100-watt incandescent light bulb, has been around since 1963. Next year, its bulb is going dark forever because of energy legislation from 2007 that mandates new, more energy-efficient light bulbs. That 100-watt bulb? It's so inefficient, 90% of its energy escapes as heat. Fear not, though. Future chefs will still be able to whip up those mini cupcakes with the new Easy Bake Ultimate Oven containing a more efficient heating element. Hasbro promises it will be available this fall. Not too long to wait. That's it for this week's Energy Now. You can also watch our mixed panelists continue their conversation in our green room online at energynow.com. If you have any questions for upcoming guests, do let us know. Upload your video questions or remarks to our YouTube channel, Energy Now News. Remember, give us your name and where you're from and keep the remarks short, if you will, less than 30 seconds. You can also friend us on Facebook, search Energy Now News. Join our discussion pages or follow us on Twitter at Energy Now News. See you next week.